and we'll start our meeting. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Propeller Live Forum. It's September 2022, and we're back to our fall, winter, spring monthly schedule. We didn't really have one in the summer too much, but uh, Ari and Chip kept them going. So today we have um, informal presentations from Chip on the state of debug and uh, maybe some sharing from Stephen on his time, time of flight HDMI laser display output and then whatever else anybody wants to talk about. So while everybody comes in and gets seated, um, I'll share a few things. This, as you, you've seen from all the email you receive, is our 35th year in business, if you can believe that. So September 4, 1987. So you'll, you'll be seeing a lot of things, uh, promotional material from us and opportunities and a lot of um, propeller content getting released this month in the emails that you receive. So keep watch of that and let us know what you think. And part of that is uh, we tell all the stories of whoever's willing to tell them. And today we posted this one, which I'll put in the chat. This is a story of Andy who wandered into Parallax to get his power supply fixed for his senior project at Sac State over 25 years ago and has not left. And when he first came to work, we put him in the warehouse. We just pushed some things aside and he wore a tie on his first day and he started writing basic analog and digital almost instantly. So Andy is still at it in a really big way and is, is critical to everything we do. And then here's another familiar face. This guy's with us today, Stephen Rocco, and here's his story. And he contributes all kinds of things through his GitHub, um, Visual Studio Code among them, um, the P2 LED cube, the recent BLDC motor driver, um, e-ink displays, and then actually some of my favorite is the Raspberry Pi IoT gateway project which we have quick bites for. So I'll give you a links to that in a moment. Thanks, Stephen. And uh, thank you for talking about yourself. I know a lot of people here don't like to do that and I really had to push you, but you did a good job. And I know it's difficult. It's just not in the nature of so many of our customers, <laughs> but thank you. So quick bites. Um, there are a total of six of them that were just published. And for those only watching the YouTube video, um, I know these links are all not not all that useful, but I'll show you how to get to them. So if you're in the chat, I just pasted links to all those in at the moment. Um, so the way you would get to them is go to parallax.com, of course. And then under propeller, propeller two, quick bites. And these are not presently um, categorized or ordered any particular way but there are roughly 35 of them. And you can just keep loading and seeing what all is here. So many examples to work from here. And what is new? Um, first, I'd like to show you this one, uh, running the IoT gateway that Stephen provided on the Raspberry Pi for a very reliable email sending ability with the P2. So if you cruise over to that quick bite, um, you'll see here on my desk, the setup, and I made it work with this humidity sensor is very easy, very reliable um, to set up and get working. So that was the first one we published. And in the quick bite, you'll see the parts that are used and a link to the actual code used. Um, and then you'll, there's usually a link to the GitHub where it's located, but I've provided the code that we've made work with the quick bites where each quick bite appears. And then also using the, the same tool, the IoT gateway on a Raspberry Pi, we have this um, two-way web-based control. And Michael Mulholland put this one together. We just posted it last week. So there's a, a nice video showing the setup and um, same thing, what parts we used and who wrote the code. So you can go find them. And then if you received our mystery box, this is kind of what you need. I assume everyone's found it by now because there are roughly 
55 mystery boxes floating around and you got a motor control board and you got this motor and then you also got an HDMI breakout board so you can um, hook it up and run with whatever power supply you've got laying around 12 volts or higher so I'll be asking in a minute if anyone has had success doing this project and then there was a small but helpful release made with e-ink displays so we're stocking three of these from um, micro in where are they slovenia i forgot they make all kinds of adapter boards and of course all of our propeller two adapter boards have that socket on them so also video code and then there's a three-part series um, this this is something you should watch in sequence and uh, the first part of it these are all video hdmi and the idea was to be able to mix graphics and text efficiently. And so the first one was the creation of this character map and um, how to display characters. And then the second one was just creating an image. So for those who are not familiar with using image creation tools, I think in this case we used Inkscape and we showed you how to draw and output an image in the right format. Um, so the P2 can display it on an HDMI. And then in the third one, we mixed it up and we combined the text from the first one and the images from the second. And you could see we overlaid the text on the images. So the idea with this is to give you more ability to use um, the HDMI ability of the P2. And it's one or two people have already asked for more low level documentation here because they want to change resolution, this kind of thing. So we don't have that yet, but hopefully this will give you a solution so you don't have to use custom graphic displays and just drive it straight from a P2. So it minimizes the learning of more, more platforms and should speed you up with your projects. Um, so any questions on the quick bites? Looking good, and it's fun to see Michael doing that work, producing those yeah. videos. So that was cool. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, he's got that polite British accent, and it's welcome, mm -hmm. isn't it? Wonderful. Also, Raspberry Pi. Um, I think you know we're a Raspberry Pi approved reseller now, and that's great. But the only problem is actually getting them. And this has been fascinating. We put these things on the website. I don't care how many we have. We could have thousands, but we get more like hundreds and they're gone in a minute. So we're selling them according to the reseller prices, which doesn't give us any margin, to be honest. That's the way this works. Um, we probably lose a dollar every time we pack one up and send them out, but it sure creates a lot of enthusiasm for something. Um, so we're taking the ones that we have. Sometimes we sell them direct. You'll see them. You can add yourself to the email wait list. But then other times we put them in kits. So this is the only way we offer them at the moment. Um, this is a kit for the P2 where we basically just bundled up with an extra prop plug, prop plug and a mini breakout board and the cables. So you could do the IoT quick bites with the Raspberry Pi. So we have 30 of these in stock and um, come and buy them. Yeah, and, had, we don't have a P2 edge in there. That would cost a lot more, but then it'd be the whole setup. Because I think a lot of people that come to the site are probably just interested in that Arduino thing, right? Or, or, the, or the Raspberry Pi. They're just interested in getting the Pi. So they're the people that don't normally buy from us. And so when you put it with the P2, they don't know what they're looking at yet. Um, so we try to lead them to the quick bites to show them how we're using it with the propeller. But yeah, we could put a P2 edge in here and see what happens. Things get more expensive, of course, but we were, let's see. We're just still experimenting here. Well, part of it is you're selling the Raspberry Pis for less than half of what they are everywhere else. Yeah, and that's a requirement of being a reseller. So when you look on Amazon, like that might be what you're talking about, Carol. What what happens is they come and scrape them all up from us and they resell them on Amazon for twice the price. Yep and yep. So anyone have a mystery box hooked up and running? I just Motors. got it a couple days ago. 
Okay. Looking forward to seeing what you do with that, Carol. Maybe you need a second motor. You might produce the first robot with it. Yeah, I'm right now in the process of learning to use ROS, right. which is kind of time consuming. <laughs> Well, if you have a mystery box, the documentation for it yeah. is this quick bite. So I'll also drop that into the, the chat right now. So thanks for buying um, all those up. We still have about 20 left and nobody knew what they were getting, but they are a value uh, for certain. So we're just trying to get more users on, on this hardware. And you can also control the big hub motors, the hoverboard motors with it with a bigger power supply. And there's code um, on Steven's GitHub right here. I think I'm in the right place. Yeah, I am. Okay, yeah, big and little motors. So we have both of those motors in stock. I'll have to steal the stepper motor back from my husband. Mm. Let them know you're coming. <laughs> I'm just going to take it. Well, that's all I've got. Um, Chip, do you want to talk debug? Yeah, I don't or... have. Let's see. I'll, let me share my screen here. By the way, this is my friend Tom, uh, Tom Mornini. We've been friends since I was like 15 years old, and he helped me do my first real project that we sold to a lot of video game companies like in 1982, 83. It's like 40 years ago already. But now he's been up here the last couple of days and we're just working on all sorts of stuff. He's got me, uh, he's teaching me how to use GitHub because I'm kind of a Neanderthal and a recalcitrant in many ways. So Tom's trying to improve me. And uh, we just started, we, we've also been working on a little file system idea for the, you know, there's a 16, megabyte flash chip on every one of these modules that we always make to the p2 so we've come up with uh, a scheme for making a nice tag based file system that would do everything you know it survive po surprise power downs and it would do wear leveling and all this stuff and today we were loading up the go language and visual studio code and uh starting to write like a model of the um of the file system in Go is just kind of a learning exercise. Well, hey, Tom, thanks for coming and thanks for helping Chip. Thank you. Thank, sure, sure, Ken. And congrats on uh, um, your anniversary. That is a big number. That is a lot of work and history. And that is a big deal. Thanks. And for those who don't know Tom, his first project was a video game called Dark Forest. And what did it run on? Apple II. Apple II. 1986? Yeah, no, it was 82, 83. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, high school. Yeah, I was 15, I just turned 15. And I met Tom. There was a story about him in the newspaper. So I thought that was intriguing. So I did some work and looked him up and called him. And then we got together. And, um, we've Tom has worked at Parallax in the past and he's always been around and he's done a lot of stuff with parallax people over the years we all still hate each other <laughs> it's earned regular family <laughs> <laughs> anyway um so let's see i'll share my uh well if you okay. can explain get to chip and get him to use it we have a bonus coming your way yeah. first thing well, i need to teach him is the difference between git and github which i keep correcting him but he seems well, it's like I called the Raspberry Pi the Arduino thing. You know, just... <laughs> hey. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the debugger has, we've improved, the, we've moved the serial activity off to a thread and it's running way better now. It runs at three megabaud. Um, maybe it won't on all machines, but uh, Evan H on the forum was, saying that he didn't like the direction this thing was going because everything like the baud, well, the baud rate is determined at compile time, which isn't such a problem, but he wanted to be able to switch speeds. 
you know, to be able to change the, um, the PLL settings so that you can run at different frequencies, but still have debug operating at the, at the you know, same baud rate. So what I did was I thought about it and there was really no hub RAM that we could say would always be unclaimed for that purpose because people put all kinds of different code into the chip. So I figured what if we use the last pin P63, which is the RX pin, and in between debug interrupts, put it into long repository mode and have that store the operating frequency. And then so the first thing on a debug interrupt we do is do, the, do a read pin to get the smart pin 32-bit value out then calculate our new uh, you know, TX RX mode settings for the smart pin and then plug those in and it's working. It's carrying, you know, it's reconfiguring the pin during the interrupt as a serial receiver, but as it comes into the interrupt, it reads the old value. And as it exits the interrupt, it puts it back into repository mode and writes the, the same clock frequency it had when it came in. So I'm gonna fix up um, the spin interpreter so that I will put a little cage, a little rep block around the clock change code and have it do a write pin or a WX pin if you're in debug mode so that it will it will track frequency changes in real time and uh, you'll be able to um you know debug as you're changing clock frequencies so that's kind of what i'm working on here that was a little unexpected sub project before that i was working on the file system but i'm on this little dynamic frequency detour any questions about that Sounds great, Chip. Yeah, actually, yes, because I mean, most software provided by third parties save save clock print frequency in the lower hub run. Um, except that Spin is kind of doing it on a different place than the other ones. But um, why do you need the repository mode when you can just read the the current setting out of the hub. I mean, you need it anyways to switch. Yeah, so. well, the spin sets up the clock frequency at some point. I think um, the compiler uh, sets it up somewhere else, you know, that Eric writes uh, FlexProp. And a pure assembly language program, you know, there's no structure for this stuff. So figured. People, if they're doing debug, they're not going to be messing with P63. They're going to let it just be itself. So that's like the only little oh, cranny, yeah. nook or cranny that we can use that would be likely safe. And we can, you know, put 32 bits in there. Uh, so I have a question about the debug window chip. Yeah. So I. I saw it in the documentation and I, I thought it was a myth because I've never been able to get it to appear in propeller tool. And oh. I thought all I had to do was define a debug main and then start up a cog and, and a magic uh, cog debugger would pop up, but that's never happened for me. It's because right now it's only in the peanut program, which is kind of a crude little text editor, you know, that I have. It doesn't even have scroll bars or undo, but I just use this as a test bed for development, but it'll compile you know, any program that's meant for the propeller tool. Uh, but I put it in here first. So when it's, you know, in a, in a mature state, which is coming up here, then Jeff will implement it into the prop tool. But right now you can only get it. Yeah, there's Jeff. You can only yeah. get it by going to the forum and going to the thread that says latest peanut version and downloading it. And it's then- B35. Yeah. Yeah, V thirty five V I think is the latest. Yeah, I actually um, uh, over the last couple of days I've been integrating this new debugging feature into the propeller tool. So I'm hoping to have it uh, released within the next two or three days. Oh, okay. Well, Jeff, hmm. I'll have some very late breaking better stuff for you to put in, but I don't think it'll change much on your end, right? Because you've had to. There's a few key places where you change a few, a few function calls, right? 
Yeah, and I think that uh, what, what what you're doing next probably won't be that much of a change for yeah. what I've already integrated in. So, so after I get through this step and get it working, I'm expecting the next step to be really quick. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, does, let's see. Does he need access to the current code? He has it. Yeah. You you have access to my peanut repository right? yeah in fact my in fact my my um audio wasn't working earlier but i was congratulating tom on teaching you how to branch hey hey because I, I saw it i saw it on the private repo when i went to check something a while ago he's and he's also learning about rebasing so his commits are no more work in progress 32 times in a row <laughs> all right yeah look everybody's happy i told you Oh, I know. That's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah. I mean, it, I I just need to get my yeah. head all the way around it, and then I'll know how to really use utilize it. I've, I've worked with Chip long enough to know that within a very short period of time, he's going to be a get ninja. Mm -hmm. He's almost a conceptual completeness, and once he gets it, he'll be an app. Right? And he's yeah. almost there. It took me a long time too, and once I did, man, I I hardly do anything without Git anymore. Yeah. It, it saves it saves my tail so many times as I'm writing code and screwing up code, yeah. <laughs> and then I fixing love, it again. Yeah. I going back people, in time. I tell people that Git is to any software developer as a hammer is to every carpenter. Like it is the indispensable tool for software development. Period. Yeah, and and Tom has like a very high standard for how he keeps things organized, I would use it, I would tend to use it, at least in my current understanding, as a way to like, you know, keep my files backed up and uh, and I can go back if I need to. But Tom is like really, he keeps things highly manicured. Like, oh wait, we've got a new file. Let's make a new, a new branch for that, right? Is that what you call it? And then- Well, it wouldn't be a file, but like a contextual change. Yeah, yeah, like, contextual change. It means something, right? Like really clean commits and, you know, always keeping master completely ready to build, like, you know, best code on master kind of thing. That's yeah. nice. I'll get a certificate at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, and, and one other thing about the, uh, the debugger is that you can see this, this is an old P2 edge. It doesn't have pull-ups on TX and RX. So what would happen is TX would float at times during entry into debug, you know, amid downloading and flash programming and all these things could, that could happen. So that would cause a break condition because on the prop plug, there is like a 470k ohm pull down or something. It's really high impedance just so that we don't wind up charging up things that we plug into, you know, we force them to power down. Anyway, uh, I've, I've made a bunch of changes to the way, and Jeff, this is going to affect what you're doing. I, well, no, maybe it doesn't actually. I just changed all of the code that is that runs on the P2 up to the point that debug starts so that if debug is going to be going on, it puts the TX pin into, into TX mode so that it just stays high. So that it doesn't like, you know, fall low and then the PC thinks it has a break or a zero byte coming in and, and it messes up all the, uh, you know, subsequent stuff going on. You mean at first run, if it has a debug, debug enabled, it does that? Yeah, so when you download stuff with debug enabled, it has uh, a few ex extra instructions at sundry places that keep that smart pin in the TX mode from the very outset so that the PC never sees any data coming in that would have been just like break conditions. You know, like we quit driving TX, and it goes low and the PC thinks a zero or a and or break condition came in. Right. So, so it, it guards against that without the need for pull-ups because I just plugged this module in one day and it wasn't working and I was showing Tom, I'm like confused. I couldn't figure out <laughs> what would happen and there was no meaningful Git to go to that I could have unraveled it all with and so on, right? Anyway, nice. yeah, so learning some new things here. Well, Jeff, when you've got the propeller tool release ready, um, we'll put it in a newsletter right out to propeller to users immediately in case people are not on the forums. 
Sounds good. Let me know. And it's good. You're ahead of your son's schedule that you gave me the other day. Yeah. First time for everything. <laughs> um, did you want to talk some more? Oh, yeah. Okay. So the file system. Okay. We'll go back to here. The file system, we've worked out a really cool set of schemes to enable like complete foolproof like transition from updated sector to updated sectors from older sectors so that no matter where the power accidental power down might occur we have a recoverable system and it was like a lot of in fact Stephen Rocco and I went over it it's evolved some some somewhat since we spoke Stephen but he oh, helped nice. me kind of work out the details someday but one day but anyway it's going to be nice and um you might lose a right but you will never corrupt the file system yeah, the worst you can do is not get an updated write file. You might have, you'll have the old version, but in one atomic bit programming operation in the flash memory, it validates the new sector and gives it priority over the old sector with the same ID. Really cool set of concepts. And it's yep. and we've added some some uh, CRC 32s to it to really make it so that as it's erasing it's going to booger up the, the hash right away, you know, so that we're going to know that it's going to make it more robust than it was when we were speaking. Yeah, we'll be able to detect, you know, like the bad chips and stuff like that. Like if bits change later, like it's, it's going to be a nice, it's going to be a very simple, yeah. but really robust file system. Yeah. And okay. we're, oh, go ahead. Um, I, the, um, the use case I have, in in mind which is maybe the scariest of all possible use cases is i'd love to be able to put my firmware in the flash but also support auto updating the firmware from the sd card so it would you know check for the presence of a updated firmware on the sd card and then load that into the flash would would, would a use case like that be supported do you think yeah I, yeah I, yeah i don't see why I mean, not yeah it would be um, also, I was thinking about, I was in the process of implementing a hierarchical file system where you have a root directory with subdirectories with files and subdirectories beneath those and all kinds of, you know, a normal kind of tree structure. And uh, we kind of, I was thinking that, I know that's how everything works, but that there are problems with that because, you know, Parallax has been around. Never is a, my thing is running now. What's working now? Anyway, uh, over like, you know, 35 years at Parallax, I've accumulated all kinds of files. And what would happen oftentimes is they'd be squirreled off in directories. And I would kind of think, well, I don't need that directory and I've got a huge pigsty here, so I'm gonna delete that. And I would inadvertently delete some of my old work. And the trouble was everything was being stored in this hierarchical fashion, which over time was becoming the problem. And I, could, I didn't have any like qualitative awareness of what all these files meant, right? Only that, well, that's a weird, obscure little directory. Maybe I can get rid of that to clean things up. So started thinking about this. Maybe Tom recommended, well, that's a, you need a tag-based system. So in a tag-based file system, you have like not a file name necessarily, but you have many tags. And the combination of tags, tags can be any, any you know, strings words, numbers, whatever. So it could be like a, you know, Unix path or even it could you know, be a C, path. C colon backslash, right? Like, yeah, it could be any, I mean, it, it's kind of compatible with other systems in, in the sense that you can just use paths to store whole file names. But if you had a, a set of a collection of tags and a unique collection of tags constitutes the equivalent of a file name. So it allows you to have a flat system but you can sort out all of the files and store them according to their qualities that are expressed in, in little tags. So I'm gonna do this system <coughs> that way so that it uh, it's a little bit new, but I think it's a lot nicer. And if we had been living with tag systems all along, we never would be losing old stuff because we'd always know what the old stuff was. We'd know that, oh, this is a special thing I've had forever versus, oh, I think it's in some box inside another box inside underneath the table in that garage you know because that's how our directory systems become over time they become just fragmented messes where we lose stuff but 
It sounds tags, like Google Drive, is it? A little bit. Yeah, I mean, it has tag functionality for sure. So Chip or Tom, what are some of the general uses of the file system for, for people like me that don't know much about it? Like, tell me how, I, how I'd use it. Obvious, obvious first use case and embedded, I think, is uh, log files. Right. Data oh yeah, yeah, log. Yes, yes, log files um, would be helpful, and also um, we can easily make a like a little shell, right? That you can you know interrogate the file system with. But once we have that running, you could call up applications. It becomes kind of like DOS or something, which means we could start compiling applications to use only limited resources that are configurable at call up time. So you could actually then from the command line call up multiple applications as long as you've got the cogs, you know, to spare and you've got some me memory arbitration system. If we have like the, you know, the 32, here's a 32 megabyte RAM version of the uh, P2 Edge. So it kind of enables, sets the stage for, for much better like system level operations instead of, you know, everything has to be done when you download, that's it. Right. Now there's, that's useful for a lot of stuff, but to be able to have a living system that you can dynamically, you know, run applications within has a lot of value. Right. And then uh, I think it was Steven who mentioned um, firmware updates. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's kind of a huge thing, particularly um, in the tagging, I think will work really well for that. Cause one of the things that almost certainly won't be in the first release version, but the tags will work really well for uh, uh, file versions. Right, so we can have the same file and conceptually, like if you open it and write it again, we could increment a version number and that would be perfect. Yeah, for a little extra tag would be V1, V2, and it could automatically delete, you know, whatever the current version is minus 10 or so. So you can have like a running history and that, that would be really nice for log files and things where they don't yeah. get out of hand and clog up the system eventually. <laughs> Application. You haven't mentioned also for Ken's benefit is that it gives you the ability to have a, a, a boot time, something to run into as well. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, applications, file systems, data, whatever. Yeah. I mean, what I, the, the exact same things you use a file system for on every computer, I suppose. But I mean, you've got the, you know, space and time and capacity limits and whatnot. But I mean, 16 megabytes is way bigger than the first hard drive I had. Well, yeah, when Tom and I met, we were both programming Apple IIs, and those had like 64K bytes, and they had a floppy hard drive. And, but, you know, that we made do with that. That was our world then. And 16 megabytes would have been unimaginable. Like, what would you possibly do with that? You go to the moon? Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. about what size the computer on the first lunar lander was. Yeah. Oh, that thing was super tight. Yeah, it was like that. Yeah, much can be done with if, if you handle resources right. What's really fun I want to get into is, you know, using like synthesis algorithms to generate complex stuff on the fly. That's a lot of fun to work on. Another, you know, for any kind of sensor logging applications, we mentioned logging, but now that you have some HTTP or a, a Wi-Fi capability, like you could, and especially with like cog based system so you could have you know main code writing to the file system on a regular basis and then another cog could be shuffling that data up over the internet and if there was an interruption of your internet connection you could continue to operate logging and then it would catch up the next time it connected mm. i mean you can use it for a ton of things asynchronous it's, you know uploading is a great yep. use case is it going to have a search engine? Yeah. Well, when you have a tag-based system, yeah, you have to have a way to filter out, you know, files and be able to pick one. But it, I don't think you're talking about um, contents of file search. Yeah, you're talking about like a tag name, a tag search, or a content search. Um, it'd be nice to have both tag and content. Yeah, I mean, we could. We can. Yeah, that'd be a later version, I'm sure. Yeah, we we can read. I mean, if we're if, if we can pump that thing at like 100 megahertz and get two bits out per, that's 25 megabytes per second. I mean, it would take less than a second to read the entire thing and, and to find something. 
Hey, Chip, can you talk about your wear leveling algorithm? Hmm. Yeah, well, what I figured we'd do is just see to have like a truly wear leveling system, you can't have any, all sectors have to have like equal treatment. You can't use a couple sectors to maintain. I mean, you could, and you could design it such that they would wear out slower than the rest, like have a little, like, you know, you count like one, two, three, four, and draw a slash through it. One, two, three, four. You, know, you, you could do that with the bits, but what we'll do is just um, analyze. When we mount the file system on, on boot, then we, we recognize which sectors are unused. And so for rewrite, we just randomly pick one. And uh, it'll be kind of like a bell curve. You know, most sectors will get like a median amount of, of rewrite. A couple sectors will get a little bit more, but it'd be very extreme for one sector to wind up with an inordinate amount of writing because it's just the odds are against that either, happening. Right? I thought we were going to do them so well, what well, doesn't matter, but yeah, one way or another, like yeah. every basically every update writes a new block. Yeah. And which frees up an old block. Which frees up an old block. And then that as you continuously reuse the blocks, you only need to erase them when you're out. And that'll speed up the operation dramatically because the erase operations are very slow. Um, so yeah, it's gonna it's gonna work really well. And and basically what it'll do is it'll use every block and then start over. So back to Jeff's question, the load leveling or whatever you call it. Are you saying I don't need to know where I'm writing things to? No, it, it you just can... write into the file. Yeah, wow. no, it's where leveling because where... you know devices like Flash and um, SSDs have uh, a limited write cycle per cell to where eventually it wears out and it won't hold any data anymore. Yeah, it's like a hundred thousand erase and program cycles. So you yeah. want to. You don't want to keep hammering on the same sectors for any reason. You want to just completely distribute the erase, the writing and erasure throughout all sectors. It's like a new way of thinking, but we don't have to worry about things in the past like we did. Right, and it it just keeps it it keeps it healthy for longer, yeah. even right. if you're like really pounding on the same what you think of as the same spot in a file. It's not really wearing out that spot where it's being stored um i one question chip and i had this is a great place to ask um how and again probably a later release like it seems that you know open write close you know append operations are probably the most common um what is the feeling on the group of how many people need kind of random file operations like like random access random within a, access within, within, a a, file. within a single file reads are easy well we can take care of that too i, I know i know we can but there, it's all code and it's all thinking like and it'll come eventually but like you know the kind of thinking the order of operation should be open right close and then we can do the random stuff later you know like in the next release like because we want to get code out that's simple and bulletproof and hardened for the most common use cases and then subsequently add new functionality. Yeah, you can you can definitely work around not having the seek function pretty easily. But the one thing I would definitely want in the early version, if possible, is some sort of a, a booting option that integrates with the propeller ROM, like a magic tag that says boot me first. Oh, nice. The boot tag. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's cool. That's a great idea. I'm going to write that down right now. Um, who is that should be doable, right? Yeah, anything's possible. Yeah, it's well, always a matter of software. That is a super good idea. I don't think we've ever talked about booting from a file. That's great. Well, oh yeah. Well, let's, yeah, we could have. I mean, you talked like, about it in like the grand scheme of things, but yeah, yeah, yeah that's well, super he's great. Talk, he's talking about taking something off the SD card, right? Is that what you're talking about, Brian? No, we're doing both. No, I, I'd like to be yeah. able. To, I, I think it would be. Um, the most flexibility if you could boot the propeller uh, from flash, um, yeah. just as has been done traditionally, but have that boot functionality integrated with the file system functionality so they coexist. 
So like you tag. Them yes, absolutely. Tag. Yeah. That, that's yeah, the super boot, awesome idea. The boot file could actually, it'd be like an auto exec oh. bat file or something. Yeah, you, and and that's, you know what else would be cool want. is we probably should have a thing like right, right hub to dance. Yeah. Like just one. Boom. Oh like, yeah, yeah. 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 We, all that would be in there. Yeah. Cool. So not, I, I didn't hear many takers on random writes. Random reads are kind of super easy, but um, random writes are probably a little more tricky. But we can do it because because we have a, a, a technique to swap a sector out. Right. And um, so we can, no problem. And it has wear leveling inherent and everything. I know. I mean, we work through all the use cases, like they're all there, but it's just, again, one thing at a time, right? Yeah. And do you mean by random, random writes, uh, sectors or bytes bytes yeah like offsets within files yeah i think that's very important early or eventually mm. well i'm coming from cool so there's <laughs> a different, different <laughs> mindset on data <laughs> yeah so you want to be able to write records in a kind yeah, of fixed yeah, length kind length. of like like in a, in a, in a yeah. Well, in the ISAM file system or something, you know? Um, I mean, I, there, there's absolutely nothing standing in the way of getting that done. And maybe it'll just fall out and be super easy and be there on the first one. But I don't like, yeah, I would just, I, you know, I would encourage all developers always to release early and often and build on working code <laughs> rather than shoot the moon, you know? Yep. Yes. Like being able to boot doesn't require that. And I think that's kind of a bit more juice than random rights, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, get yeah, I mean, um, starting different programs from Flash, kind of having a small shell to say, okay, now I want to open an editor and now I want to open a compiler. <laughs> <laughs> um, is this Michael talking, Michael Summer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, I mean, one way for instance, Michael, that you could do kind of a record-based system using this, it might be a little inefficient, but you do have a lot of spaces. You could write a file per record and tag them by record number. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that would help, yeah. Right, yeah, so there, there are certainly options, right? And maybe maybe that covers that need entirely. It would definitely be, if, you, if you're writing small records, it would be pretty inefficient. But. Yeah, but that sounds good. I mean, I'm quite in space, not time. Sorry. I'm I'm quite interested in bigger data used by the not, not just logging. I mean it's more like kind of indexing and accessing it over an index. Um like like the basic index sequential file systems they had in the eighties and or still have on my mainframes. Um Sure. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. We understand that use case for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't want to have something like a SQL server on it, but at least some ESAM database. You know, kind of right. yeah, yeah. Like having stuff per day or whatever, you know. Uh, What's the SQLite? <laughs> so, more feedback for Chip and Tom on the file system before we move on. There's a few things in chat. Uh, Johnny Mac said he's going to use it for his laser tag project and um, suggested we stick with standards programmers are used to. Um, and there's a question from Ryan. Uh, maybe you can answer, Chip. How easy would it be to access files through PASM? Oh, yeah. Well, you would just use the. Uh... Oh, oh, through PASM. OK. Uh, well, I think we would have a low level interface. Yeah, just a documentation issue, right? Yeah. Yeah. You'd, you'd probably set up a little data structure and call to this thing. And uh, I mean, we could do it a number of ways. We could have a cog that's always dealing with the file system, or your cog could call into that hub code, say, with some parameters. And then your cog would do the work to write, read, and write the files. And we could even, we could make it peer to peer just like the debugging is so that it doesn't really require any dedicated cog to handle the file system, but all cogs interested would, you know, wait their turn and we could use a semaphore for that. 
and they would uh, be able to, you know, you, we, we could have many people, many cogs working with the file system simultaneously. That wouldn't be a problem. Um, uh, Bart Grantham said, I write Go all day long. I'd love to throw down on some fun Go projects. Um, I'm not making any promises and I don't work for Parallax, um, but I do have, like, I need, one of the reasons I'm up here is to learn a lot because I'm super inter interested in writing a um, PASM and um, what's the other language called? Spin compiler in Go so that is, you know, right now we're stuck on Windows and just can't have that in my life. So, but that's not a parallax project, that's mine. But uh, I'll, we'll get you some details as that starts coming together, Grant. Love some help on that. Yeah, we just before this meeting started, we loaded up Visual Studio Code and uh, we got the Go stuff connected, but it, it, according to Tom, it's not working as easily as it does on the Mac. Everything's kind of well, it's like, it's probably me, and it, but it does appear the plugin thing seems to be like basically entirely missing on Windows. Like you can install anyway. Nobody cares on this, but mm -hmm. except Grantham and Chip and I. But, also, yeah. also be aware. Uh, Eric's asking a question here. Eric Smith. I want to mention him too because he does the uh, Flexbin compiler, which is many languages to PASM and Spin or or for download to this thing, and so. Be aware that that compiler exists as well, and it's multi-platform, wonderfully so. Um, yeah, Eric, it would definitely be some kind of spin object. It would be nice, though, to have a, a spin compiler that produced spin bytecodes versus uh, assembly, because Eric has a really nice compiler, but it takes a lot of space um, where we, at the, at the trade-off of getting a lot of speed, my projects tend not to need the speed, but do need the space. And that's where the bytecodes help. Yeah. But I think I and a lot of other people will applaud Tom's efforts to create a cross-platform tool, because if anything has been difficult for Parallax, it's competing with other products uh, that do offer multi-platform tool sets. Right. The, the diff... I don't know how difficult it is. It's probably not as difficult as this. I, I'm not suggesting it's difficult, but um, you know, talking to the device in a OS independent way is a bit of a mystery to me. But yeah, I, I think I would generally build it as two parts, right? A compiler, maybe even a spin and assembly compiler, and then um, take that and compile the bytecode. I mean, there is something I would like to ask. Um, and again, this isn't a, just to be clear, this, I am not speaking for Parallax and this is not a Parallax project. It could be in the future if it turns out well and they want to take it over or whatever, but this is not coming from Parallax. We should probably I'm, I'm a big that. fan. I'm a big fan of Eric, um, for different reasons. One is multi-platform. Even if I don't really need it, I'm just Windows and, and mainframe. And I don't think I can get uh, Eric's compiler running on a mainframe, but <laughs> um, but uh, what he is doing is that he basically has multiple languages compiling down to the same. Um, oh God, I don't know what it's called. Um, kind of a simplified representation, and then he compiles it down to either. P1 assembly or P2 assembly, or now even thanks to other um, P1 bytecode on the P1. And he is also working on the bytecode uh, interpreter for the P2, but that's not finished yet. Or I mean, it is working somehow, but it's not finished yet. This is the C compiler guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah but it's not oh, just. Hey, it's, hey, Eric, sorry, I don't know your name. I'm kind of new yeah, to yeah, So it, it's not just C. You have running C, spin, spin one, spin two, basic. Yeah, I understand. I about something else. And they run all, and you can even mix it in one program. Right. So you can I, write a C program and include 
spin yeah. like your file system, uh, you could uh, include that I, in a C program or in the, into a basic program. And I, I think, very, uh, yeah, I think that's super cool. Uh, the question uh, is because uh, Eric has some sort of file system already implemented in basic and C and in spin. It's not yeah, in spin, you have to kind of include it somehow with the C. Um, but basically, he has this file system which access the local SD card or the file system of your host as long as you are connected to the host. Um, so you can even access the PC file system or your Mac file system from the propeller. All of that he implemented with some system, I think it was it came from plan, plan 9 or something, I'm not really sure. Um, but my real eventual motive here is to allow us to run go on the device, but that's a big Yeah, problem. see, Tom has always had these kinds of ambitions. Like when I first met him, we were going to make like some kind of point of sale computers using like 60, multiple 6502s with overlapped memory. And, all that. <laughs> and Tom was thinking, we're going to write this all in C. He was like, Tom has a total, been a total C guy. And uh, way back. So he's always liking these things that are new. And I'm kind of always like a little, I'm backing into the future. He's running into it. <laughs> <laughs> think and that, now he's retired. So he's here today just because this is, he's like a dolphin. He wanted to come here. So he's <laughs> no, but honestly, the um, question is if you might can kind of talk to Eric about integration of that file system into his virtual file system he already has running. Um, it would be really nice if the flash, flash access, I think he, Mike Green did some simple file system for flash and Eric said that it's possible to integrate it into his driver because in, in C or in basic or yeah, it's been the same It's kind of a little bit more complicated. Um, you can basically have the access files in a very easy manner um, integrated into the language already. Um, so you might, a tag file system is kind of different than a file system which has either files or directories, you know. So I'm not sure how good that might integrate. Um, um, Eric, I don't, I don't have a grammar for Go at this point. I would, yeah, I can't, I, I have no, literally, I have some conceptual understanding of what's required to port Go onto a new chip. And I've looked at it long enough to realize it's a big project that I understand very little about. So, well, hey, Bart might have something to say about it. He uses Go all the time. Yeah. Yes, Tiny Go is the bomb. Yeah, Tiny Go is really cool. Uh, sorry, yeah, I, I use Go all day. Uh, I use it for my informatics software, but we also use it to build cross-compiled for different platforms, Windows and Linux. It would be so, I think it's such a natural language for a very asynchronous system like um, the P2 or the P1, right? Like, like, I'd love to have pipes between cogs or yeah, channels. It would, it would be super, super cool. I agree. <laughs> you know, Bart, would that would, would it mean that the P two could would, would it would it if the P two can run Go? Does that would that help it be like an IoT thing? Oh hell yeah! I mean, would it allow like people to just hand it? Com is it? It's typically compiled, not interpreted, right? Correct. It is so, compiled. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. This isn't, like, it would, I don't even know what to think about it. I don't know how these things work, but I don't like, again, this isn't a parallax thing, but it, you know, it's a, it's a desert island project or something. Now that I'm a dolphin, I might swim by it once in a while. Well, Tom, I'll drop my email in the uh, chat. Just um, drop me a line if you're ever willing okay. to cool. jump Thanks. on Zoom and chat about it. Yeah. Uh, just one thing to uh, mention about Flexbin and Eric's compiler. Um, I'm running that compiler on macOS, on Raspberry Pis, on Ubuntu, 
um, and um, on Windows, and it's working very well in all contexts. With Visual Studio as the front end, I'm literally writing code in one location and remoting into each of those devices to compile. And Visual Studio is running the compilers in all cases. Um, Which so compilers are we speaking of? This is the Flexbin compiler on all the different yeah, platforms. That's, um... Yep. And so Eric's done an amazing job on making it available and making it work on all the different platforms. And it really is. I sit and work all three contexts uh, when I'm working on projects. And it's a it's a dream to work with. And with Visual Studio on the front end and a shared file system between machines, it's just trivial to do. So there's a quick bite for how to do this um, and use Visual Studio at the front end for driving your remote machines as well. Very cool. I, I would actually bark you again. I would second that Eric's work on um, uh, Flexpin is outstanding. The, the, it's the standalone compiler that you have on the command line. I use it with Vim. Um, which probably makes me pretty weird out of this crew. Well, you, um, could, you could be weirder if you use Emacs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, so I use Vim and uh, and that command line. So I don't use really a whole lot else. It is it is outstanding. And also, I uh, just so everybody knows, he's got a Patreon. Should, should yes, contribute nice. to Gold Box. He does. Yeah, it's, it's excellent work. Yeah. Yeah, Tom here loves command line tools. If it's not command line, he doesn't, he cringes. I don't have such an opinion. GUIs are built over command lines. Well, okay, Chip, you had another image up on your screen. So keep feeding the dolphin fish and get the file system done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well. Let me see where we were. Uh, let me go back to sharing real quick just to cover this. So let's see, where's the share? Here we go. Um, Okay, so this thing here, we've, we've got some audio boards coming. They're, they're at Parallax now being built. And uh, we have a, like a really high fidelity headphone driver board that gains uh, four pins for both for left and four pins for right. Makes a 31 ohm channel for each of the uh, headphones because you can get a lot of really good hi-fi headphones that have like 30 ohms nominal impedance. And uh, it sounds amazing because, you know, the P2 does have multi-bit DACs that get to where they're going very quickly. And uh, if you put four of them together in 16-bit mode, that's automatically like 18 bits without even doing any dithering or anything. Uh, so we could, I'm sure we could get like probably 20-bit quality at like, you know, maybe, uh, let's see, 20 bits at like 250 kilohertz update rate. Way beyond. Rate. Yeah, way beyond like what anyone would care about. Uh, by the way, that was this, this board here. Okay, this is the headphone board. So we have, we gain four pins together running through these uh, polymer electrolytics. So these are very internally rigid caps. They don't vibrate or anything. They get the base through. And then we have in parallel with these big caps, we have these nice film caps that are like, I think they're 2.2 microfarad. Maybe they're one. We couldn't, we couldn't really tell any difference. But anyway, these kind of get the highs through with less distortion. So we have a left set and a right set, and then they go to this headphone jack. And then the, the companion board to this thing is this one here, which has this, uh, I, I forget the name. It's like a Japanese company makes this chip here. It's a four channel, 32 bit, 192 kilohertz, like parallel ADC. So this, should be pretty good. I mean, it's a lot going to be a lot better than using the pin ADCs for audio, you know, because the pin ADCs tend to have a little bit of noise that you can hear. This thing should be just super quiet and and good. So this will allow us to do all kinds of like, uh, you know, good quality audio in and out. And even if you use the the headphone board as just a line out, it's a really nice arrangement because I found like I've got some good stereo equipment here and you wouldn't believe you know you, you'd think that uh, a preamp outputting or something a line level signal going into a preamp preamp going into an amp you think those connections are all high impedance so they don't really matter but the fact of the matter is that things like cabling does have a large filtering effect if your impedance is not very low and it creates a lot of just 
audible, just dynamic degradation of the sound quality. So when you have something like this, it's gonna be 30 ohms per channel. It's, it can drive a really nice audio signal into another piece of equipment, or in this case, also directly into headphones with quite a bit of, you know, it, it, they can play louder than you'd ever want to listen. Tip a fun example for your file system might be to load it up with a bunch of music samples and turn the P2 oh, synthesizer. Yeah. Yes. Nice. Yeah. And I was thinking I've got a little DAC here that, that I use for my stereo and I could just take that SP diff thing and I'm sure it wouldn't be too much code to just, you know, take that in, break it down into samples and output those to the head, to the DACs that drive this headphone board. And I'm kind of curious what the sound quality would be like. <laughs> I've got a good pair of headphones that I think I could probably evaluate it pretty well. But I'm, anyway, it's kind of a fun thing. A lot of the stuff that's inside the P2, like the Cortex system, was designed with audio in mind, you know, being able to synthesize signals and process things and do all kinds of DSP. So this is like kind of filling out what the digital hardware does. I, maybe I just noticed, but rack-based synthesizers seem to be very popular again, you know, the Euro rack style. And it seems like the P2 would be a great component for people that are building custom synthesis modules. I would think so, yeah. I was saying the other day oh. too, Chip, with, you know, with a, a bigger version of your Gertzel input, you know, a, a theremin, a P2 theremin would be a lot of fun, especially since you have the, you have the, analog inputs, you could do all the, the tuning parameters like you find on a traditional Moog theremin or one of the big Russian. Oh yeah. Probably make a very nice sounding, very analog sounding theremin with a purely digital P2. Yes. No, we can we can resolve inputs, analog inputs well enough that they're getting, they can be way below the perception of discrete steps. You know, which is what matters. You know, you don't want to hear do, 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 do. you want to hear. Uh. Um, Tom just reminded me he had made some notes earlier. So one thing we're also working on is a real time clock. We're going to make a little module first that can go onto the, uh, you know, onto the 12 pin headers for our boards. But um, eventually we're going to integrate it right onto here. We can put it right here. And we've got a little chip from N NXP that has like battery stuff built in. We've, it's, it's not that much money. It's like a buck or so. And then we can marry that with uh, a lithium rechargeable battery that's like five millimeters across. It would keep the thing alive for a year without it plugging in. And then when you plug in the module and power it up, it would recharge that little lithium cell through a probably 1K ohm or 470 ohm resistor. It's very low current. But the point of this thing is, a real-time clock is, of course, nice to have because now you can start to do timekeeping operations and do things that are on schedules rather than just responding to I.O. Yeah, terrific for log logging, data logging. Yeah, for data logging. And this is like a really important part of the file system, like the whole concept, because you want to be able to like time mark your files, right? That, that always matters. So... Tom says not really. I'm sure he has his reasons, but I'm I'm it's used to for, seeing times. Just for clarification, you, when you guys keep talking about file system, you're talking about a flash file system. Yeah, right? it just it just uses the built-in chip. Right. Where is it? Right? But at some point, remember, in the real world, we have to get data from there to somewhere else. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's thinking of the SD card. It would be nice if there was a, a flash file system driver and an SD system driver that were very, very similar in their behaviors so the, and, and were compatible with each other so that you could swap and move. You know, and for example, in the laser tag, when we're downloading a new application in the current P1 version, we send down the new app in a bunch of chunks and write it out to the SD card once everything is hunky dory, we copy that over to the EEPROM and reboot the P1. We are going to need to do that same thing with the P2. Yes. Yeah, we definitely, I, you know, we've identified that handling different storage mechanisms, you know, needs to be easy. 
Yeah, when you look at guys like uh, um, he, he, I don't think he's on, but um, uh, Tracy Allen, you know, he's a PhD environmental scientist. He's been using basic stamps and propellers for years, building environmental monitors and, you know, doing data logging things. So this is a case where you want to data log to a device that he can pull out and then, you know, plug into any laptop or other desktop computer and read those files off. So that the, if there's an SD system, it could be different because it's got to be compatible, but it'd be nice if internally in the spin stuff, it was, they were, it was very simple. You know, we weren't thinking too much about, about where it's going uh, after we've decided where it's going or where it's coming from. Yeah, well, two, yeah, two separate file systems and a file copy operation. Yeah. 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 yeah that, that would, was what I was asking about to kind of try to connect to Eric uh, because he might have certain requirements, but as Mike Green was building his flash file system and that's also just without directories, it's just flat, flat one flat space. Um, Eric said that is possible to integrate in his virtual file system was currently uses SD card on P2 or via serial connection uh, file system on the PC side. Um, and it is easy to handle because it has a classic uh, functions you have in, in it's open, close, bright, uh, seek, um, bright, word, long, I mean, directory search in that case would be then a tag search sort of yeah and you yeah. could use you could use the same function names as used in, in c basically it's like in c it has a seek and then uh, i don't know um i'm not not a c programmer i'm a COBOL programmer so i'm there's a lot of missing in c for me <laughs> um but eric has that virtual file system already integrated in all his languages just and you can use it in in spin also by including an object you know yeah. So in that, and in that it would case, be nice if, if your flat flash file system could be integrated in that virtual file system thing he already has. Well, that that's um, why I was asking about the spin object. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, <laughs> yes. we can hear you. Oh, great. Okay. There he is. Um, that's, that's why I was asking about the spin object, and and it should be pretty straightforward. I mean, if it's got the usual read, write, um, seek kind of interface. It should be easy to integrate it. Yeah, when it, yeah, totally. And again, Eric, I think I think the flex spin stuff, that's you, correct? Yes, it is. Okay. I just I'm again kind of new to the community here, but the the thing that I'm talking about, again, not parallax, totally a labor of love, all about my love of the Go language. Like it's not a competitor to what you've done. Like, oh, no, no, no. And and I, I don't know if you saw my chat message, but I think, I did. Um, yeah, using WebAssembly might be a, a right. Really and, useful. and WebAssembly is a bytecode kind of yeah, thing, right? Yeah, that's super yeah. interesting. I kind of forgot about that relatively new Go feature. Yeah, if we could make a, yeah, that could be a good outlet, right? Yeah, it would also give you access like LLVM and some other C compilers have that, I mean, you know, they would be competitors with Flexbin, but fine, you know, the more tools we have, the better. Sure. And um, you'd get just, a whole wealth of, of I tools wonder if it's available. possible to do a, I, I don't know how complex WebAssembly is, but I wonder if you could. You know, I looked at it and to me, it seemed very abstract. Like, okay, it does these things, but I couldn't figure like, how does this relate to any kind of real world IO? Oh, I'll just, oh yeah, I think I can help with that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want a plus one on the WebAssembly idea. Oh, what and what idea is that exactly? Like, well, how, how, what, what well, to be able to have, I mean, you're talking about having a, a WASM interpreter running on the propeller, right? Right, yeah, no, no. that's that's one possibility for sure. The other possibility would be, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure the WebAssembly side of LLVM exists. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if we could implement the the uh, uh the p2 into llvm that would be 
awesome, right? Like yes. you could take WebAssembly in, which would basically be anything in the future, any language in the future that can output WebAssembly could then let you know run through LLVM and then pop out. Yeah, that kind P2. of de depersonalizes it in a lot of ways. Well, there, yeah. there is a project currently running on, on the forum. It seems to sleep in the moment. Somebody is, has ported the back end for, for Clang. Nice. Um, and it, it was, uh, uh, there's, we have to look in the forum, um, it's kind of quiet, I'm, I'm not looking much in there, but but basically somebody did, and it was already nicely working, um, just had libraries missing for kind of things, P2 specific or so, but, but uh, complete yeah. backend for Clang, and even as far as I understood, even um, in contact this thing itself to get it upstream um, so that it would be in any distribution. <laughs> um, and I mean, that would be a good web assembly. I don't know much about it, honestly, um, but might be interesting to build a chip has to build a WASM interpreter, <laughs> bytecode interpreter for web assembly. And, and we have to extend it, memory mapped I/O or something like that. <laughs> right, right. That's the that's what Chip's talking about. Like, because the whole point of WebAssembly is a run a kind of a run in a browser. Right. And the browser is supposed to be disconnected from everything for yeah. security. So, yeah. And who knows? Well, yeah, there's so so little time and so much to do. Well, speaking of, should we move on then? Okay, so the audio board, I think Ari said, Chip, you're getting samples sent up to you tomorrow. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, sounds like good future mystery box material to me. <laughs> All right, um, Stephen, do you want to talk about what you've been working on? Me? Okay. Any pictures to share? <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, I was just in the middle of an operation when you started talking to me. Hold well, on sorry, we could take a pause. Um, no, I'm good. I don't mean to delay at all. Okay, so um, our friends in Australia whetted my appetite for something, and I'll share a screen here. And they showed us a while back. Uh, share. Okay, you should see my web browser. Um, they showed us using the. They showed uh, a heat map using the time of flight sensor, and that. Remember I said earlier, if you're here early on the call, I tend to acquire hardware and then decide to work with it later. And so as soon as they did that, I bought a number of these sensors, but then I realized that uh, the code wasn't available yet. And so I talked with them and they were holding off. They've, they're working with a, uh, an interestingly, uh, uh, they have a copy, but it wasn't available yet. And so I took the time uh, since I'm fluent in the language, the demonstrations were written in, um, in C, um, I took the time to do a full port of the driver. Uh, the driver has a lot of compile time behaviors. And rather than have compile time behaviors, I wanted them selectable in our code so we can then choose to use those behaviors. And so I wanted to be able to use the time of flight sensors in, in a project. And the project was not just to have a single sensor, but to gang a couple sensors. And I'll talk to that in a minute. But just to demonstrate, um, I first had to get the sensors working. And so that turned out to be just a little bit interesting. But I was able to get uh, good communications with the sensors over I squared C. I'm moving too fast through these images, sorry. Um, here we see the me doing all the method calls to query the loaded. The way the sensor works, there's an MCU on the part. You have to download ADK with a code to it, and then you start interacting with that code. And so here I am uh, querying the, the MCU on the part for its current runtime values that are configured. And then here I am doing the set and get and making sure that they pass. So I kind of have that I can send values down and get them back and they return well. So I'm communicating with the proper byte orders and everything with the device. And then here's the sample data. There are like eight different forms of sample data. These are only three of them. Uh, first one is reflectance of the things it's seeing in the 8x8 grid. The second one is target status. 
255 says it's not qualified. Five says it's really good understanding and 13 is a little more iffy. There's more detail on that in the data sheets. And then the target detected is just a bull. Did it see something or not? Um, those are three of, this, of the eight, eight or so tables. Um, this was an early run where I was only getting three of the tables because I was badly asking the, I badly formatting the data when I queried for it. That's all fixed. Um, but what I really wanted to do is move on to something else. And I'm going to go back to the web page for a minute. And that is, I had in mind that these are a narrow field of view, just a little over 45 degrees piece. And so I said, well, hey, what would happen if we could do a real time 180 degree field of view sensor? And could we do it? And so my thinking was, let's get four of them, but that's a lot of IO, uh, four, five, six pins of IO for each sensor. And so I put an IO expander in front to handle a lot of the IO. And then I just ganged these two sensors on each uh, I squared C bus, and then the expander on its own. It runs at 400 kilohertz and these run at a megabit. And then I figured, well, what size could we make it? And so I could get the thing about three inches across, three and a half, four inches across, and do four of them in 45 degree field of view kind of model. So I put that model up there. Mm -hmm. I haven't printed that yet, but that's what I'm thinking I want to do with the sensors. And so going back to, pardon the switching back and forth here, I then um, went to, let's get a number of these sensors, let's cable them up, let's use common coloring so I can remember what the heck I'm doing. Uh, let's use a little foam board since I haven't, I don't want to run with a narrow 3D printed one. I want a much larger one for right now since I'm wearing it by hand. And so my color coding to remind myself how it's labeled. And then this is what I'm building. Nice. And so uh, now what you see is that they're on the 45 degree field of views. And the question is, how's this thing going to behave <laughs> once we put it together? When you're putting something together and there are so many cables, you kind of have to track of where things go. <laughs> so I, I always tell myself, and then which sensors are on the on which buses. And then there are uh, power uh, I squared C interface enables that I had to take care of. So here I am starting to get it to talk. And so I'm on, uh, you're, I'm using one of my own eval adapter boards where I have logic analysis pins in the middle when I'm connecting up. And so now I hooked up my USB logic analyzer. So I'm watching all the traffic and I realized I needed to see those enables too. And so that got to be fun. But the question is, I have four devices. Uh, these are those LP enables that you see in the bottom white waveforms. And can I talk to each device, assign it its own I squared C address and have it appear at the new address location? And this is the first turn on proof that I can do that. And so I literally uh, enabled the device, uh, queried its address, found out that it was the default address, moved it to where I wanted it, and then disabled it, moved the next one up, and queried that. So you see two on one bus, SDA2, then the two on the right are on SDA1. And the top group then is the uh, IO port expander that I'm talking to as I'm switching the LPNs. So then I said, well, what's the sensor data going to look like? And so I'm at the point now where I have the sensor running and beginning to show visualizations on the HDMI display. You can see the settings that I have the sensor set to under TOF settings there are the brown label on the HDMI display. Um, I'm at the point now in this project where I'm beginning to qu quantify orientation of the sensor, trying to understand the data. That's not meaningful data right there. And I'm gonna need, this is a new project demand for me. I'm gonna need to set up an arena that is a fixed field where I can put objects in it that is a little bit larger than my workbench has. So I can just set this thing there and then quantify how the sensor is actually behaving. And so I'm not at that point where I'm doing that yet. I just wanted to make sure I have visualizations on screen. This is the four by four mode for the sensor. Imagine that I've got four sensors. So the HDMI screen is going to show all four side by side. So in the end, you should be able to see if you move something across the field of view of the 180, you should see that object track all the way across all four views. 
So that's what I'm running with right now. There are extra wires here than what there were there. That's the four connectors dead center of the picture. I had to see the LPN pins and probe them. So that's got a little bit more complex when I probe them. But good proof of concept so far. I'm suffering a little bit of uh, our, our guys in Australia gave me a heads up that these things don't like to behave well together when they're on the same I squared C bus. And so that's kind of precisely what I'm challenged with right now. Well, also, couldn't, you you just, couldn't it just takes two pins per module, right? Oh, uh, yeah. These are actually seven pins or eight pins per module. To reset these devices, I have to switch the 3.3 .3 and the 5.5 .5 on and off. So that's going to require some power switching. Um, I'm also, uh, you have enables while you're programming I, I squared C address, that's the LPN pins. Uh, you have power enabled to turn on the five volts for the lasers. You have um, a, a reset I squared C line as well for just resetting the I squared C line interface of the chip. Uh, the devices are a little bit specific in that once you start ranging, you can't ask them to do anything else until you tell them to stop ranging. If you do interrupt this process while they're ranging, you will not be able to reload the device again without power cycling it. Oh, and that's just, that's just way too much fun. And so I'm contemplating a couple small five pin ICs to actually switch the power on and off. And then maybe another couple more pins of IO expander so I can control those switches. Um, and that will give me a reset capability. So I'm heading there. I got issues to work through. I have to uh, now diagnose why they're not behaving well. Once they start ranging, they get a little wacky in, the, in terms of wanting to allow me to talk to the different devices on the, on the I squared C bus. And so it could be a power issue for me. It could be that I'm not doing it right. I just don't know yet. But anyway, I just thought the concept was fun. I hope you guys enjoy it. And this is where my head is, just the kind of things I'm playing with right now. Um, wanting to Sorry. do something different and, and play with the time of flight sensors. And I want to thank um, our friends in Australia because they've been really open with me. And, and um, that's um, OzProp Dev and, and Tubular. They've been really fun to work with. And, and this is the same very encouraging. Brian Dennis or OzProp Dev. Yes. He did a presentation on these same modules, right? That's exactly it. Yes. Okay, so these have like a... Is it an eight by each has an eight by eight array of each has an eight by eight pixel field of view, right? Yes. Okay. And it's 45 to 55 degrees wide, depending on how you think about it. So there's going to be some overlap when you put them in 45s. And those reflections may or may not interfere. Uh, there are advanced modes like target motion detection that are special. Uh, areas of the driver that I hadn't ported. But my point of this project is we have two new objects that can now be released uh, for people to use. And that is the time of flight sensor object is now working well and can be used independently with a single sensor. Uh, the uh, PCF8575 uh, uh, IO expander object is working well. And that's now available for people to use at my repo. Um, and um, um, then my 180 degree field of view sensor. The code's in my repo already that I'm working with, but that's a work in progress. And that's kind of the wider demonstration of this whole thing. But if those things each have a 45 degree angle, right? Correct. Just like this. Oh yeah, I guess you'd want to put them 45 degrees apart because they're 22 and a half degrees off center. So you you got have it. to have the centers 45 apart. Right. And so that's what I did with that arrangement to so get the 180. Now, what I found out theoretically, and I still have to be able to prove it, is that um, I should be able to run right with all four sensors. I should be able to strobe all four sensors into the system and have them sitting in, my, in Hub RAM, all of the ta data tables, something at five to 10 hertz easily. Um, so you, you can imagine you've got a live 180 degree view with target detection telling you where things are and how close they are. And it'd be real easy to have an interface that says, you've got this open field where you can be driving. There's nothing in your way. Totally live. Yes, um, and you know what? You could use the plot, or not the plot, the bitmap debug window to just use, have giant pixels. Like, you know, each pixel is 16 by 16 on your screen. And you could make that display 
and then show in brightness per pixel. And it would be very little data to How feed that away. thing. You could do the four bit, four, uh, I don't know, did it, do you get, what's the bit resolution of your time of flight? Is it like eight bits or? Well, well, we get, uh, we get ranges from um, all the way out to 400 centimeters. Um, oh, yes, it's, it's a distance thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. I get distance. distance. I also get luminance of the targets. I also get quality of the detection of distance. Okay. And so I'm experimenting with which, which parts do I want to visualize. Well, um, you could, if you use that debug bitmap window, you could feed that thing very little data very quickly and see an instant representation of all those pixels. Right, that still relies on the serial port and the Windows platform. And so I'm just doing this with HDMI driver and feeding it to the, letting it. Letting oh yeah, that's right, you have your HDMI. Oh yeah, you're, you're way ahead of me, sorry. Yeah, and so I'm using the HDMI cog. I have a single cog allocated to HDMI and a single cog alloc allocated to running all four sensors plus the uh, IO expander. And okay. so now I have literally a cog running the sensors, keeping the data current in memory, and then a separate cog watching that memory and displaying it on HDMI. And gotcha. it's it's just a fast system. And this whole thing is two cogs allocated. No, that's way fast. I yeah. I was I wasn't putting together what the HDMI was doing. Yep, that's actually why. showing you all four yes. sets of data side by side why? in kind of a 180 degree panorama. And so I had that visualization in my head. It's like, well, how fast can I make it? So I started putting together this thing uh, about a week and a half ago and have been developing, porting the code to make a driver that we all could use. And then also um, uh, trying to see if the new hardware concoction of IO expander plus the sensors would actually work. In the ideal, I I'm trying to, that's a 10 bit interface from the sensor block to the P2. I could be able to, I should be able to bring that down even smaller if I don't need two separate I squared C ports, um, uh, I squared C channels for the four sensors. Uh, there's no reason why I should need two, uh, two sets of channels. I should be able to do it all in one because the, the time of flight sensing rate of sensing that I would need to make all the data local is not overloading a single I squared C. Oh, I, I so you could just share them all on one. I could share them all. Right now, the reason why I did two is to experiment with the sharing opportunities. And the sensors are being wonderfully flaky as predicted. So um, <laughs> I, I have to work through that. Once I identify the issues, um, it should work on a sync on two I squared C buses, one for the slower, one for the faster. Right. Um, only because I want to keep the, uh, the four running independently, the, the four sensors. So I'm thinking, you know, less than eight to 10 wires from the, from the sensor block to the P2. The, the three of those are power, two powers in ground, right? And the rest are data and control. Nice. Kind of fun, kind of fun. That is a yeah. beautiful presentation and I congratulate your test strip and development, Steve. Oh, thank you, thank you. Also, so basically full self-driving in like two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hmm. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> uh, it's it's kind of a fun sensor because there's no moving parts and it's wide 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 field of view, and uh, eminently fast enough to have sitting on top of a bot a wheel platform. Uh, you may already know that since I did the BLDC drivers with the six and a half inch motors, that I've got like a, a nineteen inch diameter wheel platform, just wanting sensors. <laughs> I see where this is going. I would love to have one of those big, heavy robots ripping around parallax next time people come. 30 yeah, miles an hour, barely making the corners. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe uh, tire tracks behind yeah. the corners. It'll be fun. Uh, we had, um, you're familiar with the old HP calculators, the uh, like 16C and things like this. They're about yay big, right? Um, our guys, when I joined the... Uh, uh, the group that was doing optical drives uh, in HP, they were up in Greeley, Colorado. When I first met the group, I had to step out of the way. There was tape on the outer perimeter of the building. And I said, what's that for? And the mail delivery system was an eight foot tall, uh, three wheeled robot. And it was run by one of those little HP calculators and it was line following and it was just a stack of mailboxes. And the, the incoming mail would be piled on this thing. It would run around the building and the secretaries would wander out from the different regions of the organization 
and go to the box, get their mail and, and drop off mail. And so that's how I saw the robotics early on 1989 timeframe. Oh, wow. It was, it was an HP 71 or an HP 75 that was running those mail bots. Probably. People, people kind of used fun. to play games with them because they had other sensors on them to make sure they didn't run into people and right so they people would purposely get in front of them just to see what would happen it would actually talk and say you know you know make noises at you in that so fun people were always tinkering tinkering with them yeah it's fun too much fun it was it was back in the days when we were allowed to use the production facilities and parts for our own projects too so that was kind of fun you see All right, these? thank you for the time. What do you have there? Oh, those are the coils. Those are the inductors, yeah. So we can try these in series with the motor driver and see if they smooth out the DC. But I'm thinking something this thick probably has a resonance of like maybe what the what we're trying to turn the motor at, <laughs> you know, through its through its three-phase pattern. Right. I don't know. Well, I'll, I'll try it out. I got those things they been sitting on my desk for a while. Nice. It'd be fun to hear what you find out. Oh, uh, we have uh, with the uh, mystery boxes going out. We have people turning on the driver now that we have together, and that was fun. We had questions. We have a little bit more chat in the um, forums about the motor driver, and so I did put up a little bit more information. If someone is so inclined about trying to add another VLDC motor, uh, there are four key points of research that you have to do to add it. And so I at least documented that now up at the repo. And so cool. it's a bit of work though. It took me like what, two weeks to get the uh, Doco engineering motor working, you know, and that's with what I already knew about it. Uh, Chip, we're getting requests for a little bit more theory. So I may contact you and have you just Kind of talk me through one more time of how the how the driver is working and why, and then I'll just write that up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Call me anytime. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording so we can go on to other topics.